Folks, uh, welcome to everybody who's on the call. We uh, appreciate you taking a few minutes today. We're excited to have uh, Tom Tyra and uh, GSP Airport as our uh, primary speaker for today. So we'll, uh, David, we'll just give it another minute or two and then we'll we'll get going. Um, it's such oh, a pretty day. It is. Tom, we just need to uh, decide if you would like me to forward the slide through or if you, if you would like to be All the right. way up. Well, let me try to share the screen. And if okay. that doesn't work, then we always have the backup. Hola, Marco. Nice to see you. How you doing, Justine? Good, good. Hey, Mark. Hello, everyone. Hey, Dean. How's Hello. everybody doing? Hello, Amy. Two days in a row. <laughs> Hi, I know. We're on a roll. Yeah. We see Amy at least once a week. I know. It's good it to see you guys. I like it uh, for sure. Well, that was a really good session. I was so glad we had a really nice group yesterday. It was really informative. Um, you know, I work in healthcare and I, I learned a lot. It was some of the statistics and data presented, was it was really interesting. Well, that's why I was excited when uh, DHEC asked us to partner with them because, um, you know, the information is just so uh, strong. You know, it, it's really good information for the community. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of times people don't have access to getting that information necessarily. So um, wow. I'm glad that we're able to to work with them and get, get people um, connected to that information. And hopefully um, it will, you know, help uh, inform some of the, the decisions around what to emphasize uh, in the local communities around their health care. So I think it's really good. Uh, it's a really good, you know, practice and a really good idea. Well, uh, we, we'll get started here in a second, but I see my good friend Tim Todd. How are you? Uh, you better watch out. I think there's a soldier or two uh, behind you. You're on mute. You better yell louder. I was double muted. I have to, I have an external speaker. It was muted and the other one was muted. So sorry uh, about that. Yeah. Well, you better watch out because it looks like they're coming to get you. Yeah, well, somebody's always after me. So I figured that was appropriate to have that background. Very cool. Hope you're doing well. Doing okay. Good. We need to catch up soon. So, David, I know we've got more people uh, who are registered to come in, but I certainly want to be mindful of people's time and get started. Uh, we've got some great content today, so if you want to kick us off, I would appreciate it. I'd, I'd be happy to. Welcome, everyone. Once again, glad to have you uh, at our monthly TAT chat, and uh, today it is, um, you know, sometimes we have speakers where um, people try to figure out how this applies to their part of the, the 10 counties that represent 10 at the top. And there's no doubt that GSP Airport touches all 10 counties uh, that are part of our program. And um, so it is my pleasure to welcome Tom Tyra of GSP Airport. He is part of the executive leadership team uh, under our friend Dave Edwards and GSP. And in addition to being just such a strategic uh, benefit to to all 10 counties. Uh, they're good partners to 10 at the top. They're good hosts, partners, uh, sponsors, and um, just just all around good, good people. So um, Tom, I was looking at your title, Director of Communications and Air Service Development. And I'm, I'm going to be honest here with everyone. I had to Google what air service development <laughs> is. And I'm wondering, are, are you the person that convinces airlines to add new routes and invest in, in GSP? And I know that a lot of us probably have some opinions on where the next route should be, but I, I think it's worth noting that there's a air freight, air cargo component uh, that, that my guess is maybe you have some interaction with on, on that side as well. So uh, clearly, I don't know exactly what you do, but I do know how <laughs> GSP is. And, and, and I'm proud of the 60 years that you guys have been serving this market. So I'll turn it over to you and, and thank you for being on today. 
Okay, now thanks for having me. Uh, let me make sure the screen works here and hopefully you're going to see. Um, Absolutely. Is that is that just a big blue screen that says GSP or does it say 10 at the top? In a There's 10 at the top and GSP. All right, okay. But so not well, in I'm, presentation. I'm only mode, like three um, years into this, so. Tom. Yeah. There, there you, you go. go. Now it's in presentation mode. Yeah. 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 Now I was just making sure I, I burnt through about three laptop computers over this Zoom experience we've had over the last few years. And and I, I can't tell you all of them weren't thrown. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So so David, uh, just to answer your question real quickly before we get in the presentation, I'm I do um, oversee the the group that goes after uh, new passenger and, and cargo airlines. There's a, a bigger team for the cargo airlines that works with our our aviation services uh, division, which is called Cerulean Aviation. They do a lot of the cargo and the corporate flying. Uh, so there's a team that, uh, that, that I work with there to do cargo development. But uh, typically, um, uh, my team looks after trying to get new airlines in here and to expand the current airlines we have. So Anytime that uh, anybody has a um, any comments on on air service, where you want to go, if there's companies that are, have a new need, let me know because it's uh, it is a constant uh, courtship with the airlines to make sure that one they know what's going on in our region, uh, but two can they do something here that uh, ultimately will make them some money. And uh, so I'm the guy who tries to convince them they can make money here. So uh, so hopefully we'll have some stuff for you in 23 on the passenger side. And uh, with any luck in the next 10 days, we'll have something with uh, cargo, uh, nice. something pretty, uh, um, you know, it, you'll, it'll turn your head, I think. So uh, hopefully. So let me get into, um, you know, the, David kind of mentioned that we are in the, um, the 60th year of our operation. In fact, our 60th anniversary is October 15th. So it's over this weekend. So this week, we're actually doing a lot of anniversary type of activities um, to uh, let passengers know, you know, what we, what's brought us to this point, and then a little bit of a glimpse of what the future holds. We have a pretty aggressive uh, infrastructure plan uh, over the next uh, 20 years, but most of the plan is actually going to be probably in the next 10 years. And a lot of that's to keep up with the growth that we've seen in the upstate area. Um, and and frankly, just the changing dynamics of, of avi uh, aviation. So uh, let me kind of take you back a little bit. 1958, now, I don't know how many of us on the call were around in 58, but it was a pretty good year. So uh, at that time, My Fair Lady uh, opens up on uh, in London, the, the play version. Uh, microchips were invented by Texas Instrument and the peace sign was invented. Uh, in 1958. So pretty interesting year. Um, the Edso Corsair had its all of its two and a half year run of existence. Uh, pretty awesome looking car. I can't imagine why no one didn't buy it. And much to my mother's chagrin, Elvis joined the army. And uh, But he did okay afterwards. He had a pretty good singing career there for a couple years after that. Uh, but something else happened in 1958. It was really the start of the jet age. You know, prior to that, uh, from World War II on to uh, the late 50s, really domestic air service was all done with turboprop type of aircrafts like DC-3s and others that held 20, 30 passengers um, were, you know, the pictures all had everybody in dressed up in their suits. But I can tell you, uh, after riding in a DC-3 a few times, um, I'm not sure how they kept their coffee in their cup you know, when they were flying. But uh, that was really how uh, aviation was designed at the point. And when it hit 58 was when the Boeing 707 was, uh, was uh, unveiled. And by early 1959, um, commercial service in the U.S. Uh, was starting to transition pretty fast into jet service and getting rid of the smaller uh, turboprop type of service. So what has happened there is that all of the airports up to that point were designed for the smaller, slower aircraft. And uh, so you would have 4,000 foot runways, 5,000 foot runways, but jets uh, need about double that. 
uh, to make it work. It was per particularly the early jets, which weren't the most fuel efficient um, uh, types of aircraft out there. So they needed lots of runway and there was a lot of airports out there, including the ones that had commercial service in our area with downtown Greenville Airport and Spartanburg's airport that just weren't set up to be able to handle these new jets. And so that uh, kind of sparked an, an opportunity amongst the business leaders in uh, Greenville and Spartanburg in that um, this new jet age was also going to be a thing that, that the upstate needed to be a competitor and needed to be a player uh, because even back then, Charlotte and Atlanta were big, big competitors for our area. And um, for us to really be able to bring in industry here, uh, they wanted to make sure that we were as competitive as possible. And the start of Jet Age was uh, what they thought was the entrance. So in 1958, you actually had a proposal put out in November of 58. Um, and it was led by a, a coalition of business leaders that were from Greenville and Spartanburg, and frankly, from Greer and a number of other communities as well, including the, the state legislature, to push building a, a one airport between Greenville and Spartanburg. Because at the time, Eastern Airlines served both airports in both cities. And Eddie Rickenbacker, who is a World War I flying ace, but also the CEO of Eastern Airlines, basically came to the community and said, hey, we're buying jets and you're going to have to decide which city that we're going to serve because we're not going to serve both and you're going to you're going to need to figure it out. And so because of location, because of distance, because of expense, and frankly, because they wanted to make sure they're going to be as competitive as possible uh, in the southeast, there was a proposal put together for a joint, um, jointly funded uh, airport. Uh, in the Piedmont area. And so there was uh, uh, a gentleman who kind of took that on on behalf of the business leaders. And it was uh, a guy named Charlie Daniel, who was part of Daniel Construction, which eventually became Fleur. And he had a, a longtime collaborator uh, of Roger Milliken. And Roger Milliken, of course, of Milliken uh, and Company, the, um, those two really were the brainchilds and really were kind of a driving force to get people on board uh, to support this because, you know, as you know now, sometimes it's hard to get communities to work together on joint projects. And, and back then, um, frankly, to build airports like this was, was unheard of. And so uh, it really did take a whole, a whole region uh, to pull something like this off. So they needed to find a place that was uh, equidistant, you know, good for um, uh, people in both communities but also a place that had some ability to grow uh, as the community and as the region grew. So there was a small town and, you know, in fact, on maps, it's almost been erased, um, but we, uh, we've actually preserved it in some museum pieces here at the airport um, and, uh, and actually did some documentaries with some uh, former residents of this area, but it was the Flatwood community um, that was a, right where GSP is sitting right now and part of where BMW is sitting right now. It was a, it, it grew peaches, lots of agricultural land, but as the name would imply, it was a nice flat place. And it just so happened to be located uh, adjacent to the newly constructed Interstate 85. Um, and so Flatwood, outside of no, being known for peaches, was actually known for a semi-professional baseball team called the Flatwood Peaches, that there is still a sign on Brockman McClyman between GSP and BMW on the side of the road, a historical marker that is actually where the baseball field that they played. And they used to get crowds from all over to come see these guys play. So in 1961, ground was broken um, on, the, on the current site. And, you know, when they went and got it, it was very important to make sure that there was plenty of room um, for airports to grow because as the jet age was going on, nobody really knew what the next level of airports were uh, eventually going to look like 20 years from now. So the, the original site was just over uh, 3,000 acres, and we actually over time have expanded that out. We're now about 3,700 acres of, of land. And uh, again, you know, there's, there's Roger Milliken and the uh, and the engineers uh, when they were building the airport. 
they uh, they really spared kind of no expense. Now, the final cost for the airport was just over $10 million, um, which was a lot of money back then. Now it's, it's kind of, you know, uh, a, a normal project for us here at the airport these days. But they hired the best engineers, the best architects uh, around, and, uh, and they had a, a pretty ambitious goal. And the ambitious goal was we wanted this airport done by 1962. So the airport, in fact, um, was completed in just 15 months, uh, which today would never happen. But back then, it was virtually unheard of that you could get a major project from groundbreaking to opening day in 15 months. And so on that day, uh, we had about 100,000 people show up uh, for, uh, for the opening day. And it was so big that they actually had to do the press conference on the roof of the airport. And of course, this is before TSA and security. And so you could have 100,000 people wander around on your airport um, and looking at the airplanes and going back and forth, there wasn't any security. But on the new I-85, there was actually a 10 mile backup on, on the interstate. Now, today at five o'clock, it's about like that. But uh, back then, that that was something that that didn't happen. And you can see all the cars in the parking lot here that, you know, it that's before we actually had parking lots. We had a parking lot of maybe 100 cars at the time. So this was parking on the grass and had the Blue Angels, had air shows, all kinds of things in 62. So it was quite the uh, the festivity um, that went on and, and uh, you know, big newsmaker at the time. So you can see the people here just standing on the ramp. Um, you know, it's uh, th that's something we couldn't do today. But the uh, the first passenger actually uh, was the Lloyd Hunt, who was the uh, the mayor of Greer at the time, the city of Greer. So he beat out all the other guys. They drove down to Atlanta, hopped on the plane, and then got off first. So the newspapers would take pic his picture first. So um, pretty pretty snazzy guy to to make sure that that happened. So the original 1962 uh, opening airport, this is a, a shot of, uh, you know, after we get all the crowds out of the way, what the airport looked like, but it had a 7,600 foot runway. You remember I said, you know, most of the airports up that time were four or 5,000 feet, but this was what was needed for, uh, to handle jets. And they wanted to make sure, because this was going to be actually the first purely jet age airport constructed in the United States. So everything else was a converted World War II field. This was gonna be the first from ground, you know, uh, ground up airport uh, built for to handle jets. So there's a lot of first ever things that happened at GSP, including in pavement centerline lights. So if you've ever seen in movies, airplanes coming in for a landing and they say, hey, turn on the lights and you see the, the light that goes down the middle of the runway and then you have the two edge lines on the other side. Um, prior to that, you only had lights on the either side. You didn't have anything down the middle. And so we were the first airport to actually have those installed. Uh, also high-speed turnoffs for taxiways. So jets to get them off of the airfield uh, quicker, you didn't have right turns. Everything was uh, like a 45 degree angle on the taxiways. So we still actually have those today. They've gotten away from installing those, but um, we kind of got grandfathered in. So we still have some actually in place today. And what that does is when this airport was built, and you can imagine, it's not like they had a hundred flights a day back then, but um, they could handle a flight, a departure every 45 seconds when because of those taxiways. Um, if they were really going full steam. Now they wouldn't use it, but they were they built that in uh, you know for for future development. And they as I mentioned, they wanted plenty of uh, room to grow. So lots of uh, lots of land around the airport. And we were the first airport in the US to actually have an airside garden. It's one of the things people know about GSP. Uh, they enjoy it. They you see the eyes every day pop open and go, gosh, I can really go out there and I can watch planes and I can let my kids run around in the grass. Um, that was back then we didn't have security checkpoints. So people could go out uh, anywhere out in the garden or, or go out, walk out to the airplanes. But as TSA came into place, um, actually in the seventies, you had security checkpoints. And then uh, after 9-11, TSA came into place. 
we were really the airport that went to battle for T with TSA and the FAA to be officially approved. Um, and we were the first one to be approved to make sure that we had a compliant uh, airside garden because they wanted to shut it down. They said, no, no, it's a security risk. And, uh, and Mr. Milliken really went to battle and said, that's not going to happen. And um, like in so many other cases, Mr. Milliken won. <laughs> and so now a lot of other airports uh, are starting to install these types of gardens uh, at their airport, uh, including I just saw one at Denver and I think Atlanta's working on one as well. So back in the time, this was actually a quote that was from the dedication speech that, uh, that Mr. Milliken made. And, and, and I think it has a good, uh, a, a good message for today as, as you know, the communities in our region um, and, and Tenet Top's really helpful in, in bringing this conversation together, but, but bringing lots of people together to work cooperatively for big, for big projects and um, things that individuals can't do by themselves, but working together, you can do really big projects. And so his, his thing was, this airport is truly a gateway to this area, and through this gateway will pass the people who will make the future of the area and the airport will be a model of cooperation between Greenville and Spartanburg for others to point to. And, and I think that's true. I mean, it was uh, the, these guys, um, the designers, the FAA, uh, Department of Transportation, everybody else said, you know, I, I don't think this is going to work. And if it wasn't for a cooperative effort and really steamrolling this thing through, we probably wouldn't have an airport like this today. Um, so back in 62, this is actually a promotional brochure that was handed out during the first uh, few months of the airport. And the interesting thing is if you kind of, it's, I know it's small print in here, but uh, some of the language in here is uh, almost identical to if you put a brochure together today. Things like um, Greenville Spartanburg Airport serves an estimated uh, 996,000 population within 50 miles. And we're one of the most prosperous sections of the South. And here, manufacturing has found an ideal business climate for relocation and expansion. Um, so, I mean, it's it's a lot of the same type of language you would have. And they were definitely looking at this airport. Wasn't so much to go visit family and friends. This was a a business investment. This was economic development when they when they built this airport. Um, and at the time, they were thinking of that in 1966. This is four years after it was built. They were projecting about 120,000 passengers. They actually did 195,000 uh, at that time. So it was uh, almost immediately a success um, after they they uh, they launched it. So today, this is what GSP looks like today for those who haven't been out and seen us lately. Um, but we still, in fact, the original building is still here. Uh, when we did our multiple expansions, and particularly during Wingspan, um, we actually built a building on top of the original building. And so there is, um, uh, it's not just a second floor, it is a, it is a building that sits on top of the original building that we then connected. So then we wouldn't have to shut down the original building during construction. So we'll just kind of go through a couple of slides here that are, you know, yesterday and, and today. So this is the original airport uh, back in the 1962 era. You can see the airside garden at the very top of the black and white picture. And you have some uh, Electras on there that, that uh, Piedmont and Eastern used to fly in here. This is the current day B concourse. Um, and you can see it's kind of our ticket lobby there. Next to that is a shot that was taken about five days ago. And so you can see the B concourse with the four, uh, the four gates on that um, and the garden, and then a whole A concourse and a much larger terminal building. But you can kind of still see remnants of the original building. And at the bottom of the color picture, you kind of see a lower level there that's kind of a, you know, a rectangle comes out um, towards the bottom of the picture. That is the original breezeway that, uh, that was there uh, in the black and white picture. You, so you can see the building that we built on top of it, and they actually don't touch. There's actually a gap of a few feet between the two buildings. So this is the, the curb front from, from uh, back in the 60s, and you can see very, at the time, was pretty avant-garde. It was very modernist, modern type of uh, uh, architecture, um, but it was also 
you can tell it was built by a textile uh, person because it is, there's no windows in the building. You know, it, they're only at the top. And so a lot of concrete, uh, this thing's as solid as it, it can be. Um, and it was built to last. Uh, so in wingspan, we had completed in 2017, we actually took out most of the front concrete and replaced it all with, uh, with glass. It lightens up the building, also allows us to use less electricity so you can use daylight, but makes a, a pretty big difference. But you can still see the remnants of the original building uh, in, the, in our remake of that. This is the original airside garden um, and then a garden that was taken about five days ago. So um, still, we moved around the fountains a little bit. We've had some statues put in over time, but still kind of keeps the flair of a place to go out there where you can relax a little bit on your flight, a little bit uh, higher level of amenity than, than sitting in a hold room with about uh, with a carpet that's had 400 Starbucks, you know, you know spilled on it. And, um, you know, just a, a place for people to come out and you just see their eyes light up when they, when they see the, uh, the garden if they've come in from another city. So this is our, our interior. And back in the, the, the 60s, of course, no security checkpoint. So people could come out, see family members off on their airplane, sit out in the garden, uh, grab a bite to eat, go out to, you know, we'd have a lot of people come out to the airport after church and go to the Windows restaurant to eat. Uh, today, we have a, a grand hall area because with TSA checkpoint, we had to, uh, all of our concessions were on the public side and there was nothing to eat on the uh, air side. So we went, uh, when we were going through the renovation, we created this grand hall area that now has become kind of the focal point of, of the terminal. This is a, a, how you would have boarded your flights in the 60s all the way up to, gosh, the early 80s. Uh, going down the breezeway, uh, had two different checkpoints, and you just walked on out, got on your airplane, you know, showed everybody your ticket, and, and all your family members were sit right next to the airplane and wave you off. Um, I actually walked down this breezeway today. You know, there's some airline offices in there, but there is a, that's a, that breezeway is still uh, in existence today. Won't be boarding airplanes that way because everything's now second level boarding. Um, that looks a little bit like this. So. This is the new uh, concourses that are built on top of the original ones. And, um, you know, everything is, is jet bridge uh, capable. So we can actually serve an airplane up to about a 757 uh, aircraft. So about almost a 200 passenger, 250 passenger airplanes. One gate can actually serve a 747 passenger service uh, uh, aircraft. So still working on getting one of those, but uh, we actually have capabilities of doing that. So this is the old fire station, basically a couple garage doors and a cinder block building. Uh, back during the pandemic, we, uh, we replaced that with really an emergency um, central command. Uh, and you can see the fleet of uh, rescue vehicles that are in there. But up until 2020, um, our firefighters were all living out of the original firehouse that was 1962. So sharing beds and... Uh, um, still had the, the poles that you jump down and all that stuff. So uh, the new facility is uh, a little bit a uh, little bit more uh, comfortable than, than where they were prior to uh, uh, 2020. So today uh, we have nonstop service to, to 20 destinations. We have seven airlines. Um, you know, we're still kind of rebuilding from the pandemic. We're about 80, 85 percent recovered back to 2019 levels. Some of that is airlines just don't have enough pilots to fly. They laid off a few too many uh, during the uh, the pandemic. And, um, you know, they're still recovering from some of that. They actually thought the recovery would take longer, 24, 25, before the industry came back. And it actually came back in, in 22 and early 20, uh, going to be early 23. So we think that we, um, the discussions we've had with carriers here recently uh, 23 looks like a, a pretty promising year for us. Uh, so we may see uh, another airline name join that those ranks and, uh, and maybe a couple more dots on the map. So it's always a constant uh, effort, but um, we feel pretty confident that 23 will probably be a, uh, a year that we may have to uh, introduce some folks to, uh, to some new flights. 
And so on the cargo side, uh, this is something that was really never envisioned when we built the airport back in the 60s, but is definitely a big focus for us today is that, um, you know, we actually have uh, the only nonstop international uh, cargo flights uh, to uh, at all in the Carolinas, so North or South Carolina. And um, we have um, about between five and seven flights a week going into um, Frankfurt, Germany. We have ad hoc flights from Mexico and Canada and various places around the world. And um, we will most likely in the next few days, um, actually, it's, actually it's Halloween, I think, is the date that they're planning on doing the first operation, but that we'll have um, nonstop service to Seoul, Korea um, coming up around Halloween time frame, and that will be a scheduled service as well. So that'll be the first time that there'll be an Asian uh, cargo flight uh, in the Carolinas as well. So the other thing that's really important for us is because we had so much land uh, back when we first built, we want to make the best use of it and make sure that it's because it's hard to undevelop land. You know, once you have it, you kind of commit to a certain look, a certain feel for how the land's being used. So we have dedicated uh, the nine parcels of property that we have out for all for very different uses, anything from uh, around the inland port for um, cargo development and warehousing logistics to aerospace um, um, uh, research and development, to aircraft uh, maintenance and repair, to manufacturing, um, to office space. So a little bit of all over, but it's a, a constant uh, work for us to make sure that we find the right match and that we also be able to preserve our ability to continue to grow uh, in the future if we need additional runways or we need additional facilities. So this is a big thing that uh, uh, that is, continues to kind of pay dividends for us. This is the International Logistics Park. So it is adjacent to the Inland Port of Career, if you're familiar where that is. The, at the bottom of the picture here, you'll have all of those little, those little looks like Legos. Those are the train car uh, containers that come in and out of the Inland Port of Greer. The five big white rectangles are the buildings that sit on our property that we are the landlord for that... Um, that does warehousing and logistics to support operations at, at the inland port. Still have some room in this uh, industrial park. We're getting close to being full, but we still have some big parcels left in there. And anyone who does development in this logistic park, um, part of our deal with that is it's required to also do business with the inland port because we wanna make sure that they're as successful as possible. And these are some of the buildings a little closer up. So you have some BMW, you also have some other automobile and some other logistics companies uh, uh, making up those five big buildings there. So this is a GSP, um, just from a satellite view from about a month ago, this is our terminal complex. So you can kind of see um, the A, a concourse is the one with more gates on it there. They have nine gates, the B concourse uh, has four. You see the garden kind of in the middle, our two parking garages. Um, so that looks a lot, you know, very different from 1962. But in 40 more years, it's going to look even more different. So what we're going to see is you see, again, the two parking garages, but you also now see a third parking garage, parking garage C. You see the, the building, the, particularly the baggage claim has been expanded. So you have a baggage claim on each end of the building. Instead of coming in on Delta and having to go to the far end to get your baggage, you will be served by whichever concourse that you came in on. You'll see uh, that there is the, the B concourse is much larger. It's, it's currently four gates. Um, this thing could go to nine uh, to even 11 gates um, at, uh, in the not too distant future. And part of that is also a dedicated international arrivals uh, facility as well. So a federal inspection facility for international flights, uh, passenger flights, uh, an airport hotel, uh, and then some curb front improvements that frankly aren't gonna be super in the future. We're gonna actually launch some of those um, in January. And so that's gonna be a lot more information out there, but uh, kind of totally rebuilding the roadway system at the airport to make sure that we can control congestion. And as we grow, we continue to be able to accept passengers and cars coming in and out of the complex. 
So I'll give you a little closer look at our Concourse B expansion. So we were almost ready to pull the trigger on this um, prior to the pandemic. We were uh, actually um, at a point when you start planning for things, everything's 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and you set up benchmarks. And we were hitting the passenger numbers that would start the design phase of uh, adding onto the buildings. Not that you would build it, but you would start designing it. After that, once it's designed, you start figuring out how you'd pay for it, and then you would move forward. And, and by that time, your passenger number should be at a point where you start construction. And then once it's done, you're, you're meeting those numbers. So we were about ready to do the design phase. And so we actually continued to do kind of preliminary designing on it. But this is what it would look like. So we would add on between five and seven gates. Um, the, the bigger uh, kind of building there on the end of that L there is actually a dedicated standalone uh, federal inspections place. So uh, a large aircraft could come in from Europe and instead of you having to, you know, put your bags through customs and then reclaim them, go down to the passenger terminal, you would just be able to leave from the, the, the international part of the terminal. And so there would be shuttle services, ground transportation, others right there and a bag claim in the in the federal uh, inspection station. And then you could just leave from there. There would be a hotel that's about 120 to 150 room hotel connected to the building um, with uh, airside views and, and pools and those types of things. And the parking garage would be about 750 spaces of public and about 750 spaces for rental cars um, that would be, and we would, move the rental cars from A to C and opening up more parking for those who are coming in on baggage claim off of, of Concourse A. Now the garage is actually, uh, we were just about putting shovel and in dirt in 2019. Um, and so part of what the construction that we're gonna be starting in January on the roadway is laying down the very early infrastructure to be able to put that garage in place. So we're taking the roadways around the building where it would be um, and starting to do that. So you could actually see that parking garage C start coming, uh, moving forward, having some progress within the next couple of years. So on the end of our runway, this is kind of down by um, State Route 14 uh, area, the end of that runway. We actually have uh, space set aside for 200,000 square feet of hangar space for um, airline maintenance. Uh, facilities. We have air, we currently have one now that is a subsidiary of American Airlines, but they uh, there's two or three other carriers that routinely reach out to us and and ask us, you know, is there a way to to do some maintenance at your at your airport? And a lot of this is also because we have some aviation training schools in the state that uh, provides a, a, a ready workforce to do some of this work, and so uh, you could see. Uh, a couple of airlines come in and do uh, some heavy maintenance uh, on, in that facility as well. And, and lastly, I think, I think it's the last slide in here is, is for moving, you know, even more futuristic, um, you know, it, it's something that we're looking at, how do we better manage flow of passengers and employees around the facility? And how do we do so where we can um, better manage the energy that we use to do that, and um, and and frankly take uh, advantage of technology. And so we're currently in a program right now. It's about an eighteen month long study, where at the end we will be bringing that report back to our commission, and the commission will decide whether to move forward or not. But it is an autonomous transportation system at GSP. So this is a shuttle uh, vehicle that is all electric and it is self-driving. And so basically you will get go to a parking lot and you will either use an app or you will call it from one of the shuttle um, shelters and it will dispatch out a shuttle to you. You hop on and it will take you without a driver uh, to, the, to the shuttle or to the terminal and then either go park itself in reserve or go off to the next place where it's been hailed. And um, we have three different lines set up right now from different parking lots, including our employee parking lot. But as this would come about, we could actually see a future that these electric autonomous vehicles operate on the airfield. 
They could be moving cargo between buildings. They could be moving cargo over to nearby manufacturing facilities, um, those types of things. We actually had this facility, this uh, vehicle that's that's painted up with GSP logos. We had them out for a demo back in uh, March, um, and it was pretty impressive. So we had it run all the way uh, around some of our parking lots, um, and there was nobody controlling it. It was just programmed, um, and with uh, sensors and GPS, it uh, uh, it really performed well. So that could be something that we see. Uh, frankly, if if it comes back, it's feasible. Uh, we find a financing solution for it. Um, you could see that happening uh, really within the next five to seven years. And I think that kind of brings you up to speed with, with GSP. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Well, yeah. Wow, um, Tom, just amazing. David, did you want to kick off with a, a question or a comment? Yeah, I, I make sure I'm not muted. Yep, I would. Um, I was a little curious about the big uh, Asian announcement in the cargo services. Is that because we just um, haven't had uh, the, the opportunity to be in Asia? Is there a, is there a, a business that's driving that? Is there um, EV type connectivity? What what uh, what caused Asia to be the the most recent announcement for air cargo? Yeah, well. Um... One of the big drivers uh, is that GSP over the over time, particularly during the pandemic, has really um, proven itself to be a, a, a very convenient alternative to some busier hubs. So in Atlanta or Miami or Chicago, um, planes would come in and it would take 24, 48 hours to clear customs and get your plane um, on its way. And while it's sitting still, it doesn't make any money. So uh, airlines were, we were telling them that, hey, you should come here. We have customs. We can turn your flights. And so they started trying us out. And indeed, we could turn a plane in, in less than four hours. And um, they'd started pushing it and they started looking around and they said, you know, we can, we can bring traffic from all over the Southeast, not just from South Carolina or even from Greenville or Spartanburg, but all over the Southeast. And in the time that we're saving, not having our airplane sit there, we could have a day truck drive. So we also we get things from Texas. We'll get things from Chicago that are trucked down to us to be shipped in and out. And so one of the big drivers for Asia is you have some recent announcements about uh, from Hyundai and from some other automobile manufacturers and and some other uh, Asian um, uh, manufacturers in Georgia and North Carolina and Florida. Um, Alabama, uh, all of those are potential customers for this one. So this would go to uh, initially to Korea. And um, once a lot of government uh, tape is, is worked out between the airline and, and, uh, and some of these countries, that you could pot potentially see a link that goes over to China. And then at some point could realistically be a nonstop from GSP to China. Um, that's 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 pretty awesome. I'm going to add freight turnaround to my already long list of things we do better than Atlanta. So, yeah. so thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so there's actually companies that have facilities in Atlanta. And when, when things get really bad there, they will fly them in here, truck them down to Atlanta and deliver <laughs> them because it's quicker than flying them into the Atlanta airport and going across town. That's awesome. So it's, uh, you know, if you said, say it's eight hours to get cleared, it's only two and a half hour drive to Atlanta and you do, you know, a three hour turn or something on the plane, you're actually there before it can even get checked in at the Atlanta airport. You've already delivered your package or your truckload. And and with, with manufacturing just in time, it makes a difference. You know, it's Absolutely. something comes up or you're waiting for a part for, you know, a conveyor system or whatever it is. You, you can't be waiting two days for that stuff. And uh, and so we've been able to to do that. And we think that's going to be a continue to be our, our our ace in the hole is that convenience. And that though our structure here at the airport allows us to to build facilities uh, on a much more timely basis. So when companies need them, you know, we had a, a cargo building that we built in 2019. It was 110,000 square feet. And um you know, we didn't think, we thought that would last us forever. And in less than a year, that thing was over capacity. 
So we just uh, a couple months ago uh, added on another 50,000 square feet and we have plans for actually another building that could be 160,000 square foot building uh, right next to that one. Uh, that could be, the trigger could be pulled uh, once we get a customer on board. Perfect, perfect. So, Tom, unfortunately, uh, we have to wrap up as we yeah. uh, wanna make sure we have time for our uh, county resource presentations, but just a couple uh, quick observations. And I had the pleasure yesterday of hearing your commissioners uh, talk about uh, the history of the airport and uh, of course, Dave Edwards as well. And, and it's quite amazing. You have six members of, of your commission, but four of them uh, combined uh, all have been on the board more than 23 years and over a hundred years combined, probably closer to 120 years of combined service. And I would think that uh, stability is really uh, critical for um, the airport and has been you know, one of the reasons uh, for the, the long-term success. And, and you mentioned uh, Roger Milliken and uh, Mr. Daniels uh, and, and the work that was done many years ago. And I thought it was interesting. Uh, it was mentioned yesterday that GSP has had a 50 year plan for you know as long as GSP has been around. So you're not just thinking about uh, you know the next year or even five years, but thinking about the next generation. And, and that speaks to uh, the organization and, and why you're able to, to keep uh, succeeding and, and doing things in a way that many airports uh, across the country are, are certainly envious of. Well, yeah, and that's 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 kind of the we hope we we can keep that together over time. Um, but it is very easy to keep what uh, kind of the founders and what the vision of the airport is uh, when you have folks who continue to live it every day. Um, it helps when challenges come up, you just kind of go back to what's familiar. And uh, the biggest thing is you want to make sure that you are uh, able to adapt to changes and that you're willing to be entrepreneurial about it. Because this airport was really from the beginning. You had entrepreneurs starting it up. And uh, I think you can see with, with Dave Edwards and the commission that we have, uh, they continue to be um, risk takers and uh, uh, educated risk takers. Absolutely. So, uh, Tom, again, thank you very much. And uh, the last word on this to everyone is fly GSP. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it is a great airport and it helps our community and makes it easier for Tom and the team uh, to go out and get new airlines when uh, the people who live here do fly uh, GSP. So I hope everyone will take advantage of that. Um, Justine, I'm going to turn it over to you, but real quick before we do that, Erica, if you could put up, uh, we have announced, uh, and we've, we've had the date on, on the calendar for a while, but we have uh, officially lost launch registration for our uh, Celebrating Successes event coming up on November 16th at the Greenville Convention Center. Uh, it is a great end of year event. We recognize uh, community leaders and businesses and um, have the Elevate Upstate grant final uh, presentations at this event. It is gonna be from 10.30 to 1 p.m. 10.30 to noon will be the program. Then we're gonna have a networking lunch. So uh, if you're a, a current Tenant to Top partner, uh, I have sent some out. I, I will send by tomorrow to all of our partners registration information for your complimentary tickets. But if you are not a Tenant to Top partner, it's only $20. Uh, to register. So we hope you will plan on uh, joining us uh, on November 16th. So Justine, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the resource updates. Plus there's mimosas oh, beforehand, yeah. before. You don't even have to wait till it's over. Okay, thank you. So now is our part when we get to our resource updates that we, uh, we go around the region. And so we're focusing on Union County today. We have Deandra Hardy with Battle Betty Foundation and then Kathy Jo Lancaster from Union County. Let's get started with Deandrea. Um, I had the honor of meeting her and her mom and her big fluffy support dog at a Together SC event recently. And um, she's just a lovely individual. Are you ready, Deandra? Yes, hi, good morning, everybody. Or good anyway. Wait, such a long day. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, what's been going on? So um, for those of you who haven't uh, had a chance to get to know Battle Betty, so Battle Betty Foundation, we are a nonprofit located down in Union County, and our mission is to serve and empower women veterans. So I myself am a Marine Corps veteran, and a few years ago noticed that there is a kind of really big gap in services available for women veterans, and that comes down to of course, lack of access and availability of services, especially when it comes to housing support, um, when it comes to homeless veterans. So that's primarily what Battle Betty does. So what we have in Union County down here located in teeny tiny Jonesville is a Women Veteran Resource Center. So we actually became the first Women Veteran Resource Center located in the state of South Carolina, as dubbed by the wonderful people down at the South Carolina uh, Department of Veteran Affairs. So in our resource center, what we have is a four bed emergency shelter that serves single women. We have a family room that can accommodate a single woman and up to three children. Um, we have a clothes closet here. We have a um, gear locker. So any everyday essentials they need. So everything from laundry pods and uh, trash bags to any hygiene products that they, that they need. Um, we also have peer support available and we provide case management to any of our women veterans that you see here at the shelter as well as those um, as that we get referrals from. So as far as updates, so what Battle Betty has been really working on is increasing that uh, availability of housing resources. So what we're working on is, um, it actually won't be in Union County, which I'm kind of sad about, but with the city of Spartanburg, we've been working to bring a kind of first of its kind women veteran transitional home um, to the upstate. Um, so this transitional home will be a longer term program to add on as a step up from the current program that we had. So our current shelter program is a 90 day program, which kind of helps for immediate stabilization for women vets. Um, this transitional housing program will um, allow them a longer time to kind of ease them into stability. Um, Cause unfortunately what we see with everything from our post 9-11 veterans, which is my era, which is, you know, all of us who were kind of in high school and, you know, junior high when 9-11 happened, to some of our older veterans, so women vets that were um, in that Vietnam era, is that they need a little bit of a longer transition period than the 90 days. So this transitional home will give them a 18-month um, period to graduate into permanent stability. So that's the big project that we're working on. The city of Spartanburg has um, been very wonderful with uh, collaborating, collaborating with us um, and has given us a vacant lot with permission of use to start building a home there. Um, so that's one of the big resource updates that we have. The other is working with um, the Daughters of the American Revolution to help bring transportation access, because um, that's another big barrier that we see for women veterans. Um, so it's great that we can give them somewhere to um, kind of rest their heads, somewhere that's safe and somewhere that's secure. But one of the other things we want is kind of helping them get to work and getting to their appointment. And so transportation can be a really big barrier to that. So what we're hoping to work with the DAR is, is that we're gonna get an organization vehicle that we can help with providing that transportation for them. So those are the big things that Battle Betty has going on. Thank you so much. Um, you can also see Erica put a link to the article that is in our latest newsletter because uh, I think you have an event, you have some events coming up too. Um, yes. yes, so um, coming up, so right now you can actually go on and register. So. We have our annual Beyond the Battle 5K. This kind of is an annual fundraiser for us. Um, we started it during the pandemic time. So it's a virtual fundraiser. You can kind of walk, run, ruck if that's your uh, jam. So put on a pack and go do 3.1 miles. So it is the um, kind of Marine Corps standard and everybody loves a good 5K. So you can register now and your t-shirts will be sent to you in the mail. We also have our annual Vetsmas event. It's a holiday event that we do um, what we encourage people to do, and you can send those on to our PO box, is um, holiday cards. So when we do our uh, Vetsmas, which is a holiday event, where we provide uh, women vets and their children with holiday gifts, and we do, uh, we started doing uh, cash gift cards because we used to do just food meals. But what we found is that sometimes during the holiday season, you need a little bit more than just that one day meal. Sometimes you need a little help with other things financially during the holidays. Um, but so we also like to include gift cards, kind of letting our women vets know that you know, your service matters and that we see you too. So we ask the community to, you know, send in cards. So we uh, we pack those in the bag. So you can always donate cards and send those into our PO box. Thank you very much. Uh, like I said, you can read more about Battle Betty. It's amazing what you've done with that organization. I was very moved to learn about that. 
And I know we don't have much, we don't give much time for these. Uh, Kathy Jo Lancaster is coming up. She's a director of community development at Union County. And uh, Erica, you'll please put the link to her article in the chat too. It's, there's so much going on in Union County. It's very exciting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you guys. And I'm sorry, I do not have a working camera today, but if you can hear me, that's, that's great. Um, I do have some exciting news. Uh, public transportation will be coming to Union County very soon. So we are actually working with the Chester Connector to bring just demand response service to our community. We've been working on this for such a long time. So we're all excited about it. Uh, we'll run the service Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we'll be providing transportation services within a five mile radius of the Union County Courthouse. And we'll also provide options for the communities of Jonesville, Lockhart, and uh, also uh, some of the other areas. So we're excited about that. Been working on that a long time. I do wanna give a shout out to Upstate Mobility Alliance. Keith Scott um, was tremendous in, in helping us work through a lot of this. In addition to uh, Becky Powell Moon with McCormick Area Transit. So thanks to all of you guys. Dean, I know you were very instrumental in this too. So we're excited and we're looking forward to seeing vans and buses in Union County in January uh, of 2023. I do wanna mention just a few other things. I know we're, we're kind of short on time. Economic development, uh, retail development is very much on the move in Union County. We've had some major announcements uh, recently. Myco Works, which is a uh, company that specializes in luxury leather products. Uh, they actually supply uh, to the coutures in Paris and Madrid and some of these places to make these high-end uh, products that we all love and probably can't afford. Um, and then also some uh, products that uh, are used in brick making. That was about a $107 million investment Myco Works made. And at full build out, they'll be at 400 new jobs. So that, that's awesome. We also have Tiger Companies who purchased our uh, Midway Millican plant. This is the former uh, fabric finishing plant that was in Union County. That was a, about an $11 million investment. And they actually uh, do distribution to construction, surveying office, and medical markets. So we're excited that they are in the process of rolling out their operations now. And then, of course, over 70% of our uh, investment in our county has come from existing industry expansions over the last 10 years. And we've had many of those to include Millican Standard Textile, CSL Plasma, and Dollar General. So economic development is alive and well, as well as retail. Um, sometimes small communities and small towns have some hardships here, especially when you have a population of 30,000 or less. But the good news is Starbucks and Tractor Supply will be coming to Union County and should be opening their doors by the end of the year. So we're very excited about that. We also have a new subdivision that will be coming to our community. And this will be along our commercial corridor. We're working with developers and uh, construction individuals now to roll out about 50 new single homes. And that has been a much needed need in our county because we just do not have the housing available to support the demand. There are several rural infrastructure projects going on, expanding water, sewer, upfitting buildings. Um, and this is a lot has, all of this goes back to the comprehensive plan that we recently adopted within the last 12 months. And we didn't want to adopt something that would just basically sit on the shelf and collect dust. We wanted it to be something the public would embrace and support. So we have a lot of uh, residents, a lot of public engagement that's trying to roll this plan out and make it something that will work in Union County. The last thing I wanna mention is that the Union County Fair is next week. It starts Tuesday the 18th and runs through the 22nd. Big significance here is this fair started in 1908. That means that we've been doing this once a year for a week 
for 114 years. And it is an agricultural fair. There's not many of those that started in that capacity that has continued through the years. So uh, join us at the Union County Fairgrounds. We have a lot of entertainment lined up, a lot of fun, and look forward to seeing you guys there. Thank you so much. You really you did a great job getting all that in in your limited time. Thank you, Jessica. It was perfect. Perfect. That's a great way to wrap up. It's 359. So uh, thank you to our county uh, resource updates. Uh, Deandra with uh, Battle Betty, uh, the Women's Veterans Resources. Uh, that's a fantastic initiative. Glad to see that going on in Union County. Uh, Kathy, thank you for telling us about all the economic development in Union County. Chester Connector, congratulations. Good luck with that. Uh, I love alliteration and I love two words that rhyme. So congrats on the name there. And, uh, and then finally to, to Tom Tyra, thank you very much for um, frankly, one of, the, one of the better presentations we've had talking about GSP Airport. I really love the history, uh, loved your presentation and it was just a, was a great, great addition to the afternoon. So um, with that, I will say, go enjoy our summer weather that seems to be back. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys at next month's Tat Chat. Great, thank you, David. Bye everybody, thank you. Bye.